Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I'd like to have a quick discussion here on Stokes' theorem. So we're going to see that Stokes' theorem is going to allow us to relate the uh, surface integral of the curl of a vector field to a line integral of that same vector field around the boundary of that surface. So uh, there's a couple of videos we want to make sure we've seen before so we have the necessary um, background information and prerequisites out of the way. So the first is obviously the discussion on line integrals. That's a pretty simple one. You can catch that on this video over here. And then we said uh, this has something to do with the curl of the vector field. So again, we have another quick discussion talking about what is the curl operator. And then finally, we said the relationship is to a surface integral. So we again, we have a third video discussing surface integrals. So if you've seen all three of these other videos, I think you're armed with the necessary information and we can have a quick discussion here on Stokes' theorem. It's actually not even that bad. So let's just talk about it. Um, just to refresh our memory, again, I'm going to put this up here. So our definition of the curl of a vector field was this operation. Um, and all it did was take a vector field and allows us to compute another vector field off of that using this sort of operation. Um, what it then gives us is the ability to apply Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem says this. Let's just talk it through here. Okay, it says, let S be a piecewise smooth oriented surface. Again, the oriented is going to come into play in just a second. And we're going to let the boundary of that surface S be another smooth piecewise simple closed curve. We're going to call that C. Okay. Then we're going to say, let's have a vector field F, right, which is some continuous vector function that has continuous first partial derivatives on the domain of the surface S. Okay. And if that's true, then what ends up happening is if you need to take the surface integral of the curl of the vector field over that surface S, it's actually the same thing as taking the line integral of the closed, uh, the closed line integral around that surface, uh, excuse me, the line C, right? Okay, so that's all it says. It basically says there's a, you can either take a surface integral of the curl over the entire surface S, or you can just take a line integral around the boundary of that um, surface, and that boundary is defined by a line C, and it's a closed line, right? That's why you see this closed uh, integral symbol, okay? Now, What's interesting about this is I've written it like this. Sometimes what you'll see is, again, we said at the end of the day, this is basically saying that it's, it's, it's a surface integral over here, and then it's a line integral over here, okay? And sometimes the integrand, what people will write is you might see the integrand, just this portion, alternatively referred to as just, they'll say this is curl F dotted with DA and sometimes it'll be a vector bar, right? Again, it's the same idea, right? It's, you got some vector field flowing over a surface S, so you have to integrate over some amount dA, right? And again, the A here with a vector just is to denote uh, a directionality, but it's a little bit hidden. That's the reason I like this formulation a little bit better because the, norm, the surface normal N is explicitly written here. So I'm gonna use the N here to denote the directionality of the surface, and then I'll leave the A here as kind of a scalar, right? Because the directionality is consumed by this normal vector. Again, it's the same idea. I think this just obfuscates or makes it a little bit less explicit, um, but it's the same idea, okay? And then similarly over here on the line integral side, sometimes you may just see an abbreviation of this this, whoops, excuse me, all this entire integrand here. Sometimes people will write this as F dotted with dr. Okay, and again, it's the same thing. It's saying you're gonna integrate this vector function F around the, the line C, and they'll put in uh, expressions like this. Again, it's the same idea, but remember in our discussion of line integrals, we said that when someone writes this, what we really mean is this. This is a little bit more explicit. Um, formulation of it. And let's look at all of these components maybe right now of, uh, you know, R bar, just to refresh our memory, all these sort of things. Okay. So again, let's look at the definition of Stokes' theorem. Again, it's pretty simple. It just involves a surface and the boundary of that surface. So again, let me pull up a little um, prop. Okay. So let's say you've got some surface, you know, I've got, this is my surface. I'm going to make this thing up. Okay. This whole thing is S right? It's the surface that's floating around here in space. Now, there's also then a boundary. You can see like maybe right here, this is a convenient spot to take the boundaries, the lip of this cup, right? This is a, you know, it's a nice perfect circle and this could be C, right? It's the boundary of this surface, okay? So now where this is interesting is we now need to talk a little bit about the discussion of an oriented surface, 
real quick, because we have to make sure the orientation of the left hand side and the right hand side are consistent. So what we mean by that is this little term n, right, this normal vector n, has to be lined up or consistent with the definition of the orientation of C. So these two guys need to be consistent. So what that means is if you take a vector n, okay, so there's two potential normal surfaces for this, uh, or normal vectors for this surface, right? You could have one kind of like this, right, pointing on the outside and everywhere you go around it, it's, it's kind of pointing outwards, right? You can have that as one, so this, this is one possible orientation. The other is instead of having a pointing outward, so, you know, quote unquote outward, so to speak, you could have it pointing inward, right? So the, the, the vector could, the, could be pointing in, inside the cup, right? So there's two possible choices. Now the question is, which one do you choose? Well, what we're going to choose is a normal vector that aligns with the orientation of C, because again, same thing, C has a direction or an orientation, right? As you're going around this C, you could either go in this direction, right? Or you could go the opposite direction, right? As your parameterization variable S increases, depending on your parameterization, it's going to define, do you go clockwise or do you go counterclockwise, right? So all we're going to do here is the N and the C should be aligned in a right-hand rule sense. What that means is that if you've got your surface S and your, and your, your line C, if you orient your, th your thumb of your right hand in the direction of the normal vector and you curl your fingers in, in a positive right-hand sense, this curl, sh uh, <laughs> sorry, curl, <laughs> I realize we're, we're conflicting, it's not this curl, I'm just saying as you twist your fingers or close your fingers, right, they should be moving in the direction of C. So in this picture, this is consistent, right, because I point my finger out of the surface and as I walk around it, that's how this works. You can almost think of it as a, um, uh, like, as you're walking, think about yourself as a little guy walking on this surface, okay? If you're walking along this, your head should be pointing in the direction of the normal vector n, right? Okay, so great, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So it's a right-handed rule way to make sure that the normal vector n on your surface integral lines up with the orientation and the direction of your surface, uh, excuse me, of your line c. And again, just to make sure we're on the same page, remember this term r bar, or r prime, right? Uh, sorry, r bar prime. This was the tangent vector to the curve C at any point, right? And again, it's aligned with the direction. Okay, so that's the prerequisites out of the way. I think we now understand it. We basically now have a good idea of the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this thing. So let's look at a quick example. So the example um, that I want to mention is right here. And again, uh, maybe now's a good time to plug. If you want the, the lecture notes of all of this that uh, outline all the steps in nitty-gritty detail, um, check the description of this video. There's a link to get the uh, lecture notes, the code, um, things like that that are associated with this discussion. But anyway, here's our example. Let's look at a vector field that has these um, F1, F2, F3 components in the X, Y, Z components. So you see it's a little bit jumbled. It just makes it a little bit interesting. And the surface that I'm interested in is this thing. And if you look at this long enough, it's basically this paraboloid. Okay, actually it, it looks pretty darn close to this cup we're looking at, except the cup, it, it's, it's a perfect sort of paraboloid. And we're only looking at the Z is greater than zero, so the top portion of it. And again, instead of me talking about it through, here's a picture of what this looks like. You'll see the vector field F is a little bit interesting, right? It's kind of going all over the place. And the surface S is this sort of upside down parabola. It's like a cup uh, l like this, right? Where we're only looking at Z positive values. So it's, it's an upside down cup. Okay, so now all I want to do is let's go ahead and verify that Stokes' theorem holds. So let's go ahead and we'll compute the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this expression. So let's start on the right-hand side and just let's just do the line integral around C, okay? So uh, let's do it. So now we got to go ahead and choose now how are we going to describe the boundary of this surface S? Well, we see that the real easy way to, to, to describe that is just look at the, sur the boundary in the z equals zero plane, right? So that's a pure circle that's just down at the bottom. It's, it's again, it's back to this example. It's literally the lip of the cup, right? So as this thing sits like this, it's this lip. And again, here's a picture of what this looks like um, here. And Notice that we've chosen this parameterization. I arbitrarily chose this to describe the lip of the cup, right? I'm going to use cosine s, sine s, 
okay, um, and zero. Okay, and now I'm going to choose s to run from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so the second I do this, this actually defines that orientation we were talking about because we can see as s starts at 0 and increases to 2 pi, the orientation of that c as I move in a positive sort of direction as s increases, I can now draw this, there's, I can attach an arrow to that picture, right? So now there's an orientation of that c which is going to play into that discussion when we actually need to compute the surface integral and we need to calculate the normal like we were just discussing. We got to make sure that the normal is aligned with this orientation. So you can kind of see as c walks around this curve, um, as you're seeing in the picture, you can basically see in this case the normal vector n of the surface when we get to that in, the, in, in a ladder step, that's going to have to be pointing upward, right? It can't be pointing downward because we need the two to be consistent. So, okay, anyway, with that discussion out of the way, we got a parameterization. This is r, right? Our, our parameterization r of that surface c, or excuse me, of the, of the line c. So we can go ahead and calculate its derivative r bar, or excuse me, r prime, right? That's just take the derivative of this with respect to this. And then it's just basically um, what other terms do we need for our line integral? So we got a, wanna, went ahead, we've got this term here, check mark. So we need this one. We need to evaluate the vector function at the parameterization r here, okay? So that's what we need to do right here. So here is f, it's just y, z, x, but again, y, is just this. So here's what the y values are. So I'm going to plug that in, right? Sine s. Um, z is always zero. Okay, so that's here. X is over here. X is actually cosine of s, like that. So great, now I've got this term here. So now I need to just dot product these two things together. So I dot product um, this, that's this term here, with r prime, right? That's what we just computed here dot them together, you just get this, and now I just integrate from my limits from 0 to 2 pi, right? That's to, to do the line integral, and voila, you do all this, you end up with the right-hand side is equal to negative pi. That's what ends up happening. Okay, great, so we got the left, uh, the right-hand side, let's compute the left-hand side now. All right, so now let's go ahead and compute the left-hand side of this. So let's go ahead and look now at the surface integral of the curl of f, okay? So, First thing we're going to need to do is compute curl of f. So again, um, given that vector function that we had, you go and run it through our expression for curl. You take all these partials of these different x, y, z's, you know, whatever these components were. It turns out it turns out just like this. It's, it turns out to minus one, minus one, minus one. So it's actually kind of an easy um, operation, which is actually kind of something to think about, right? Again, when you take the curl of something, it's like you're taking the derivative effectively and adding and subtracting things together, but you're effectively taking a lot of partials. So it should hopefully get a little bit simpler and as in this case it, it does. Okay, so the next thing we're going to need to do is then parameterize the surface S, right, which is that paraboloid we talked about earlier. So I'm going to propose one parameterization right here. So this is a, a parameterization and since it's a surface, right, there's two free variables. Let's call it U and V. And we're going to call the surface S to be all the X, Y, Z values that look like this. So X is equal to U, uh, y is equal to v, and z is equal to 1 minus the quantity u squared plus v squared, okay? So, um, what's interesting about this, right, is that now, this defines a parameterization, but u and v, I can't just say u is in some range of, of a number to a number, right? It's from like a to b, and v runs from c to d, right? You can't really do this. Instead, u and v, the region of, of uh, the uv plane where this surface's domain is, it's actually something that looks like this. It's a bit of a circle, right? And in fact, the easy way to discuss this actually is maybe let's say the bottom of this circle here, this is going to help set up our, our double integral in just a second. This down here is uh, where v is equal to minus um, 1 squared minus u squared to the 1 half. And then the top portion, let me just do this in red, the top portion of this surface is v is equal to, get this out of the way so we have a little more space, right? This is equal to u of uh, just a positive version of this. So it's 1 squared minus u squared to the 1 half. Okay? Okay. So um, if we parameterize like this over this region r, so this entire thing is basically the region r that we're interested in in the uv plane, you get the same parameterization. Um, again, in the notes, I've got a, uh, a mathematical plot showing how 
This parameterization is the same thing as the original surface definition that we had um, a couple of minutes ago. This is a surface S. So both of them describe S um, effectively, okay? So with that in mind, um, we've got our parameterization of the surface. We now can compute the surface normal using our expression of RU crossed RV. So again, this was our discussion here on, uh, we had another dedicated video on surface normals. Um, this is where this came from. Um, so again, I'm gonna go dot, 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 just show that, uh, okay, all you have to do is take the derivative of this parameterization with respect to U, that's this RU term, right? And then cross it with this parameterization, take its derivative with respect to V, that's this RV thing. You cross these two things together, you do some calculations, which again is in the notes. You get this expression here for the surface normal. And again, this is the non-normal, right? This is the capital N bar. Um, so again, if you look at our video, in fact, I think I have the timestamps in the lecture notes here of exactly where to get this expression here, but we showed in our surface normal video here that this term right here, this, this unit vector N, times dA, right? That is the same thing as the non-normal surface, N bar times du dV. Okay, so that's where that came from. Um, maybe what we should do here is, since we're talking surface normals, we should maybe pump the brakes again and check orientation, right? Um, so we may want to check to make sure that this normal is consistent with the C we had earlier. So again, maybe the quick way to do this is just to stare at this thing, do a spot check. So when U and V are equal to zero, right? That's the point right here. So you're now at the very top of that paraboloid. And if you plug in U and V equal to zero into our normal calculation right here, what do we get? We get that the normal vector at zero, zero is, uh, what is it? It's zero, zero, one, right? You just plug that in here. So that actually, yeah, is pointing straight up, which is perfect because now that normal N is correctly oriented as the right-hand rule with our um, orientation of C, right? So you point our thumb in the normal vector here, which is straight up, and as I close my fingers around, it, in, it indeed is going in the direction of that orientation C that we defined earlier. So great, this normal vector is perfect. I don't need to put a minus sign on top of this to flip the, uh, the sign of the vector. We're all set to go. So that's pretty much it, because now at this point, We've got everything we need here. We got curl of F, right? We got the curl, we got the integrand here. We got this term right here. This NDA is just this thing right here. We've got everything. So it's basically, it's a double integral at this point, right? It's now a double integral over um, this region R, right? So again, um, I'm gonna refer you back to our discussion on double integrals because all we're gonna do at this point is treat this as a type one region and we're gonna first integrate this direction, all right? Um, uh, so over uh, dV, yeah, V running from this to this, and then we'll integrate from U running from uh, minus one to, to positive one. So again, if you wanna see the setup of the double integral, it's in the notes. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip it. I'm gonna write dot, dot, dot here. And you can check out the notes if you wanna see it. But at the end of the day, we end up with the exact same answer. So great. So in this case, we verify that Stokes' theorem held for uh, this particular situation. So this is pretty awesome. Okay, let's have a quick, um, actually side discussion here. Um, what happens if we had a vector field that was just in the xy plane? So let's consider a vector field where it is just uh, an x component, a y component, and there's, there's no z, okay? So I'm only gonna look at surfaces that are in this plane only, in the xy plane, okay? So you basically have a surface which has to lie in the plane, okay? And in that case, what's interesting is you think about this, the normal vector of this surface, it's just the z direction, right? It's the k hat. It's this, uh, right? You got, a, you got a surface sitting here in the xy plane like this. So the normal vector has got to just point, <laughs> the, the, I don't care where you are on this surface, it's always going to be pointing up in the k hat or in the z direction, right? So that's awesome because now if you look at the term here, right? The curl times the normal vector, okay? Think about that. By the time you work this through, again, you, you run the curl through this, but now you have the situation where this is just zero, right? 
okay? That simplifies a whole lot, right? Because by the time you take the curl and dot it with just the k-hat direction because you're in the plane, you end up with this expression here. So this is what goes into this integrand, right? So this left side, I could write as, here is the curl dotted with the normal vector, right? It's just this, okay? You could do the same thing on the right-hand side, right? With this, you get this expression, right? I could take the f1 times the dx plus f2 times dy, right? Does this look familiar? If you remember our discussion, this is basically Green's theorem, right? And we had a separate video on this. And what's fascinating about this is we actually see that Green's theorem is actually just a special case of Stokes' theorem. So Green's theorem is just Stokes' theorem when you're constrained to the xy plane, right? So that's kind of fascinating, um, an interesting thing to note. Um, Last thing that maybe we should talk about is, you know, where is this helpful? Where is this useful? So there's some situations. So for example, let me show you a picture over here. Let's say you've got this case. So this is a, uh, you know, you've got a wand and you're blowing a bubble, right? It's a very classic children's toy where you've got this bubble. And look at the surface of that bubble S. That is complicated, right? Would you agree? Like to parameterize and to discuss what that surface looks like or how to even mathematically describe it is complicated. If you were able to do it, I can probably guarantee you that parameterization is very complicated, is difficult, right? Now, if you had to do this, uh, the flux integral over that surface like this, um, you're a little bit, you're a little hosed, right? There's no way around it. If you were just asked to do the, the surface integral of the vector function over that surface, you got to do it, right? That's, that's not, that's difficult. But if you were asked to do the flux integral of the curl of that vector field over that surface S, you could either try to brute force it by computing this left-hand side, <laughs> right? Which is not going to be fun. Or think about this. What Stokes' theorem is going to allow you to do is instead say, hey, wait a second, it might just be way easier to compute the line integral over the, the boundary of that surface S. Forget that this bubble has evolved and has looked into this very complicated surface. If you look at the boundary of it, the boundary is uh, this perfect circle, right? It's, it's the head of the bubble wand. I can probably guarantee you it's way easier to do that line integral over this nice, perfect circle than it is to try to compute the curl and then do the surface integral of the curl over this super complicated S. So here's one situation, and I'm sure you can extend this to other ideas of where Stokes' theorem might really help you. But again, it only helps you when you're talking about computing the surface integral of the curl of the vector field, right? Not the surface integral of the entire vector field itself, right? Okay. So with that being said, I think this is probably a good spot to leave it. I just wanted to have a quick discussion on Stokes' theorem. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. If you scroll down and click on that subscribe button, um, it really does help me continue making these videos. And the new videos come out every Monday, so I hope I'll catch you then, and we can have a nice discussion on some other interesting topics. So until then, I think I'll sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.